Happy April, everyone, and welcome to our monthly PL Andres All Hands meeting. We have a healthy working group update um, of uh, our graded Q1 OKRs, our new Q2 OKRs, and then a number of updates from different teams um, inside the Andres working group. We have a whole ton of awesome spotlights, and then a deep dive on Lassie, which is, as you might expect, because Hannah's presenting it, freaking phenomenal and picture-tastic and everyone should be excited. We should stay for lots of time. So uh, we'll jump right into it. As a reminder, the PL Andres Working Group is one of many um, engineering and research working groups within the PL network. Um, we are focused on driving breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. Uh, we work within Web3 because we think the internet is super freaking cool um, and a massive superpower for humanity. And we want it to run um, with kind of core Web3 primitives that will make it more resilient, more efficient, um, more enabling of human agency, and a great foundation for some of the very exciting and sometimes terrifying breakthroughs that are coming in the next, you know, sometimes sooner than we expect a uh, couple of decades um, uh, that we want to see built on a uh, really good foundation. We work across all tons of different projects, um, especially spend a good chunk of time on IPFS, LibP2P, and Filecoin, but also many other projects you'll hear, um, I think, a number of different updates on uh, DRAND and a couple of other projects as well um, that uh, we work on within the PL Andres Working Group. Our mission is to scale and unlock new breakthroughs for IPFS, Filecoin, LibP2P, and related protocols. We do this in kind of three main ways, driving breakthroughs in protocol, utility, and capability, scaling our network native research and development across many different teams, sharing our work openly, um, and stewarding and growing OSS projects, networks, and communities. Here is our view of our public Andrea's Notion that has all of the information about the different teams within our working group. Um, we've updated this uh, recently to uh, make sure that it gives you a good entry point. And each of these groups is doing weekly uh, sit reps, situation reports, um, so you can keep track of the, the awesome work they're doing. Our 2023 strategy, uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, um, is first and foremost to make sure we are stewarding our critical systems and growing them over time, um, keeping them uh, scaling effectively, um, that we're growing the, the like, wider network that is contributing um, towards these awesome protocols um, that make up the PL stack and helping accelerate many different teams and many folks uh, outside of our specific teams. Um, and then on top of that, we have kind of two main uh, foci for 2023. One is around robust storage and retrieval, um, scaling data onboarding, scaling CDN speed retrievals, uh, and driving adoption. Um, and then two is around compute over Filecoin state and data. Um, we get to celebrate the launch of FBM, uh, which is a major step forward on that roadmap. Um, but there's also uh, you know, many exciting updates there as well around chain scalability, around bringing compute to data um, and programming it via things like FBM. We have a public star map that highlights the, these different um, projects that Andres is working on, kind of divided into the, to our three main categories or themes. Um, and so we have uh, some exciting work that has been happening um, around uh, actually landing FBM in mainnet, that one green. We have a number of projects that kind of were landing at the end of Q1 and a couple that we still need to, to update or, or might be slipping a little bit into Q2. Um, and so feel free to go check that out if you're curious what we're working on. Here are our graded Q1 OKRs. Um, I say overall, we did pretty darn good, better than I was expecting. Um, we're um, uh, middling, so a little bit below our, our target of 0.7, um, which is green and success for uh, hitting our OKR goals. Um, we got about a 0.6 around keeping critical systems running and growing. Um, we do have monitoring, but it's not we're not hitting all of our monitoring targets in terms of maintaining really good um, site functionality SLAs. We're not alerting on these as well as we as we want to be. And so there's some monitoring there that we've added, um, but we, we didn't achieve as much as we had desired in this area. Um, we did do a lot of centralized spend cutting. I think we ended up at something around 25%. Um, of, of cutting costs to centralized Web2 infra it, within this quarter boundary. So from end of December to end of March, um, which is great, but not our 50% goal. Uh, if we had landed a chunk of our RAIA work, we would ho hope to have been here, um, but still, still great progress and congrats to everyone who's continued to work on that. 
within our uh, hyperscaling and accelerating teams contributing to PL stack protocols. We saw a whole ton of amazing new folks get involved in FEM development. Really huge congrats to everyone who uh, is now building in this space or was sharing um, the you know onboarding pathways uh, to help many new builders um, get involved in uh, building the ground floor of this ecosystem. It's very exciting. Um, we didn't do quite as good in our you know own critical uh, open roles. Um, some of these are making you know continued strong progress, but we need to get them over the finish line. We were, uh, I think, our our worst OKR in terms of setting very ambitious goals for ourselves and not not being able to to land them fully was around. Um, scaling our data onboarding and CDN speed retrievals. Um, we're still at uh, mirrored traffic for our IPFS gateway um, adoption of the Saturn CDN. And so this isn't yet live traffic that is um, being able to, you know, 100% depend on Saturn. We still have additional work to do there. Um, we ended up at, I think, 700 and... 46, about 750 petabytes of total data um, on Filecoin by end of quarter, um, which is not quite 900, but still really awesome progress. Um, and I think we're at the 200K uh, successful retrievals per week from Filecoin SPs, which again, still super, super awesome progress. Um, but we had uh, high sites for this, uh, which will maybe tune back a little bit uh, in Q2 um, based on what we actually expect to see uh, from, from our successful Saturn deployments. And finally, our fourth objective around uh, compute over data. Uh, there was some awesome, awesome progress here. Launched FEM, over 500 unique contact contracts deployed on mainnet. Knocked that one out of the park. Amazing job, FEM team. Um, in terms of interplanetary consensus, um, I believe technically subnets are live on Spacenet, but full IPC launch is coming imminently. So we're not we're not quite there yet in terms of everything, but but we made some pretty good progress here. Um, and we have, uh, you know, for compute over data, um, I think we've proven that we can execute thousands of jobs per day, but we're not quite there yet from a total adoption perspective and have something like four active exemplar partners, which is pretty close. Um, so overall, that is our Q1 OKR scoring. We'll have those up on our um, public notion for folks to take a look at. And we're now focused on Q2. Um, and so we've updated our um, KRs for this quarter. Um, there is some exciting work happening in on the critical system side around um, adding reader privacy via double hashing, which is going to be a, an exciting upgrade for content routing um, within the IPFS ecosystem. Um, there's also a number of critical improvements happening inside of Falcon land around long-term uh, resiliency and security um, that are going to be landing at some of the network upgrades. Uh, and so making sure that those land smoothly. Um, Around hyperscaling talent, we have a lot of exciting events happening, starting with IPFS Thing that is happening this weekend. In um, that, that is a, an event that uh, a number of folks in Endres are helping um, run, but is a wider community event that we participate in, um, and a number of other uh, awesome events that many folks are helping put on or um, or building out. And so, goals for making sure those are well attended and um, get a lot of visibility, um, so that those are put to good use. Um, and we uh, also have a new um, kind of like modular implementation builder for IP uh, builder library um, called Boxo, which has been emerging. Um, and I think the aim is that it is actually gaining real OSS adoption for from new implementations um, this quarter. For our um, CDN uh, speed retrievals, this is definitely like an area that's getting a ton of focus in Q2 um, with Saturn really, um, you know, uh, achieving the kind of like production adoption uh, goals. And so this is starting to get additional committed customers um, with real revenue um, and fast retrievals of data stored in Falcon and IPFS, um, making sure that our retrieval success rate of the underlying components of Saturn is high and that um, kind of some of those underlying libraries are seeing um, many uh, 200 million requests per week. Exciting goals. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, so that's uh, you know a high bar, um, and then uh, really exciting work going to be happening on the intersection of IPFS Gateway and DAG House and Saturn, all coming together to harness these technologies to reduce our spend on centralized infra and put kind of money where our mouth is in terms of the uh, ecosystem adoption of these Web three tools. Um, and so very exciting work happening there. 
uh, on the uh, compute over state and data side in Q2. Um, we have a lot of growth goals for FBM um, around actually gaining, um, you know, uh, uh, Filecoin deployed within smart contracts, numbers of unique smart contracts deployed, number of transactions happening actively within those smart contracts, and then scaling the number of wallets that are making use of all that those smart contracts have to offer. So really big focus on growth. This is the FVM ascent phase. It is ascending into the heavens. Um, very exciting. Uh, also a really big quarter for um, IPC, interplanetary consensus, and the whole consensus lab team um, deploying on Falcon mainnet via Solidity smart contracts, um, and also starting to um, onboard their first uh, major subnet users, which is going to be really exciting. Um, and then for Bakuliao as well, which is aiming to reach 1.0 in May and um, also add a lot of uh, high in demand uh, functionality around having kind of secure and observable environment for client jobs. So um, going to be a great, great quarter um, and high hopes for, for all of the teams and what we're pushing on. We'll be updating these. These are actually now um, assigned a DRI, and they're going to be giving you updates on each of these um, uh, areas within our future uh, uh, all hands. And so look forward to those updates um, starting next time. Cool. And with that, I will hand off to the IPFS team. Cool. Yeah, I'll take that, Molly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the IPFS stack, for those who don't know, it's a suite of specifications and tools where data is addressed by its contents using an extensible, verifiable mechanism and moved in ways that are tolerant of arbitrary transport methods. Um, so this particular update will be lighter given the many folks on the team have been heads down preparing for IPFS thing conference starting in a couple of days, um, but more will come here next month. Uh, a couple of things I'll call out on the KPIs. The bottom left there, the fine latency for new content. The good thing there is we're back down to the levels of near the end of 2022 when we had dialed down the hydras, which we already knew was going to have a latency hit. Um, but so some of the operational events that were affecting the network early in the year have been uh, mitigated. So that we're, we're glad to see that. Um, there are more improvements in uh, uh, defense mechanisms that we're going to be working on as well, but um, we've got that back under control. Uh, and then also in the community GitHub activity, just a couple notes here. When we talk about active users, we're trying to filter out drive-bys. So an issue contributor, for example, is someone who created or commented on at least th three, did that at least three times in a given month and similar for PR contributions. Um, so it's a little, little bit worrying the month over month uh, decline on issue and PR contributors. We haven't drilled into that yet. I'm going to be looking at the end of the month, end of April to see if that's still continuing um, and to see, you know, we, there is, yeah, just figure out what we'll do further analysis to see where that drop off is occurring and potentially why, um, but at least flagging it here that we are we are seeing that in, in the data. In terms of IPFS, um, some of the protocol and implementation highlights. Uh, yeah, so specs.ipfs.tech, the website is live. This is just a nice rendering of all the markdown files that the community has been actively working on over the last year. Um, but so there are there have been some exciting contributions to it as well. There's an IPFS principles doc that kind of starts to get into more of like, what is IPFS? And there's an accompanying blog post on blog.ipfs.tech. Uh, and again, this is trying to kind of summarize uh, a lot of the momentum uh, that was that was put in place last year around IPFS being bigger than one particular implementation. So please, please read that. And that'll continue to be a theme that we build on here at IPFS thing. Um, you Molly mentioned Boxo. This is a this is the collection of uh, IPFS repositories that have been written in Go over the last number of years. We've kind of consolidated that into a mono repo that uh, Kubo is using and uh, some other projects like the Bifrost Gateway used in RIA. And you know, we bubbled that up to IPFS cluster and Lotus as well. Uh, but it, you know, enabling users to kind of get started, we, we, we hypothesize with uh, you know, in their IPFS journey in using, using Go. Um, and so a, this release in 0 0.8 has a bunch of these repos all consolidated, a lot of docs and tooling to help people upgrade. So that, that's all been pushed out. Uh, like I said, there is a new IPFS implementation in the Bifrost gateway. It's being uh, used for, for RIA. Uh, and so another release there that has been done, particularly around uh, much tighter um, metrics implementation and being able to trace requests um, so we can really diagnose where problems are. I mean, you know, Kubo has gotten most of its benefits in this latest release from changes that have gone on in, in Boxo. Um, you can really, really sorry, read the release notes there. Uh, and he, uh, Helia is a new JavaScript-based implementation we've been working on. The V1 kind of API was quietly released, 
Uh, we've been, and the team's been kind of heads down working on a bunch of examples to or reporting over examples from JS IPFS world to show how it can be used. Um, but more to come on that, especially during IPFS thing. Uh, but please know that the, you know, all of us involved are really interested to hear your use cases and any feedback that, that you have. Um, and you know, I will be sharing more about that again over the next couple of weeks. In terms of what's coming up, again, IPFS thing, there's a lot of presentations that will be made and undoubtedly follow-ups and just empowering of others to uh, in, in their IPFS journey. So that, that'll be a big focus. Uh, you, Molly mentioned in the OKRs about reader privacy upgrades. These are happening on two tracks, one, the DHT. Um, so there's already a rollout plan that's been drafted, but we'll, we'll be finalizing that and communicating that with the community. And then with the network indexers, uh, you know, they're making changes on the network infrastructure side, but we need to get the client libraries uh, updated, particularly the routing v1 HTTP API that's uh, in Boxo so that it can also be doing reader privacy. So that, that'll be coming out. And then there are various operational items for, for RIA and some of the DHT Q1 events uh, that, that happened earlier in the year on how we can uh, make the system more, more robust. So those will be happening before the next update as well. Thanks. Hey, it's Peter from IPDX, uh, Interplanetary Developer Experience. Uh, so we try to make uh, work for IP stewards a bit nicer. <laughs> so uh, what was going on with us lately? We finally have a way to monitor GitHub Actions, which we are really excited about. And I'm not going to say anything more about it because we're doing a spotlight about it later. Uh, we also <clears throat> are moving forward with gateway confirmance testing initiative. Uh, we are already ported around 30% of the tests, and we are going to continue doing that uh, in the upcoming weeks. And our goal is to uh, port all of that to, to the new framework. Uh, we are already using it uh, in Kubo by first gateway and Boxon on every PR and push to uh, default branch. Uh, what else? We are speeding up CI. Uh, in many places, most recently Boxo, we deployed there our very own uh, self-hosted GitHub Actions runners, uh, which cut down the, the CI runtime. And uh, in the coming weeks, we also plan to do similar thing for various repositories in the lib P2P org, uh, because we started to exhaust uh, our hosted GitHub Actions runner limits there. So GitHub Actions are getting popular, which is another cool thing to see. Uh, and to sum it all up, we are going to IPFS Think, and uh, yeah, if you're also there, uh, give us a shout. Like we are always excited to chat about developer experience. Hi everyone, update from the LibDB team. So um, exploring KPIs for LibDB, um, pretty much uh, left and right side two dimensions. Um, how does LibDB behave in various networks? We're monitoring that. Um, this is in general the Kademli exporter project. Um, you can search for that and then explore the many metrics out there. Uh, this I think always an interesting discovery. And then on the very right side, um, given that LibP2P is an open source project. Um, we're monitoring how people interact with LibP2P uh, online and how they contribute to it. And overall, a uh, wonderful upwards trend. A couple of general project updates. Uh, I would say the big one, the biggest one here, uh, we have a new engineering manager, uh, Dave. Uh, Dave, welcome uh, to the team. It's wonderful to have you. Then um, a project at LibP2P is in general performance benchmarking. We have a performance um, protocol now to test performance between two nodes. We have provisioning scripts to bring up infrastructure on AWS and then um, test performance between two nodes across uh, various different networks. We're giving a talk about this at IPFS thing, so join the measurement track in case you're interested. On the community, uh, in general, a lot of interactions uh, for LibP2P and in general, I would say uh, a growing community. A couple of highlights here is Definity, um, exploring LibP2P for the state sync protocol, and then Vulcanize um, that wants to build on the new WebRTC browser to browser um, project that we've built. So talking about browser to browser and WebRTC in general, uh, browser connectivity is another big project at LibP2P. And here we just landed um, connectivity between two browsers or in general between two browsers, private nodes or behind NATs and firewalls um, that are based on the browser infrastructure or where at least one side is in, within the browser. And we have an implementation in JS and then uh, a spec merged as well. Um, and we're creating an example app around all of this. So at IPFS thing, you'll actually be able to chat um, with each other 
um, but not with a normal chat, but with a chat actually where you're directly connected to the other people uh, in the browser. Uh, so I think this is the IPFS on the web uh, track, so join there in case you're interested. Cool, and then there are a lot of implementation updates. I won't read them out at all. Um, a couple of new releases, so please update uh, a bunch of uh, work around dial prioritization, which is very important for performance. Um, and then, yeah, more users across the implementations. That's all for my end. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'll give uh, some updates about Falcoin. Uh, in terms of storage capacity, uh, we can see that the trend we have seen since like Q4 last year uh, with a decline in the raw byte capacity in the network, while the quality adjusted power is still in go going up a lot uh, with a lot of like Falcon Plus data being onboarded to the network. Um, and from the chart at the bottom left, we can see that the cumulative daily active deals on the network is still trending up and to the right, uh, which is really nice. Um, and on the right, we can see that we actually reached a new all-time high of deals onboarded to the network in a single day uh, with 5.5 petabytes of data onboarded in 24 hours. We have some Feven metrics now that we have Feven on the mainnet. Um, we have seen a good amount of uh, Filecoin being held in EVM actors, ETH accounts, and placeholder accounts, uh, with about like 423,000 Filecoins uh, in there currently. Uh, we also seen numerous uh, contracts deployed with like 662 unique contracts on the network uh, with about 170 unique deployers. So yeah, uh, highlights. Uh, we launched Fathom on the main app, uh, which is quite big. Uh, and with that, uh, we have seen uh, increased use on the network uh, and a lot of like new ecosystem services and contracts like wrapped fill, uh, staking pools, and uh, Teller, a price and data oracle. Uh, and there's tons more, so check out uh, at Falcoin on Twitter. Um, then uh, FIP56, uh, sector duration multiplier, uh, was rejected for network 19. Um, there should be some uh, um, comps on that as well from, uh, from the Falcon Federation. Uh, on the storage provider side, we have seen Supranational uh, open sourcing a new sealing software, uh, which aims to like reduce the cost of sealing and also increase the efficiency. Uh, so this is like super helpful for both current and new storage providers. Uh, we also started work on a scalable and more efficient RPC Lotus node cluster uh, for API service providers. Uh, and on the 20th of April, uh, the IPC SpaceNet is coming, uh, and you will hear a lot more about that later today. Coming up uh, very soon, uh, we will have a new network upgrade uh, with FIPS uh, focused on security, stability, and performance. Uh, the network version 19 upgrade is codenamed Lightning, uh, as it will, among other things, reduce the cron usage uh, which will give us faster block validation times, which is really important for chain quality. Something a bit different about this network upgrade is that we will have a two-stage network upgrade where the second upgrade, network version 20, is a ghost upgrade uh, that does not have any migration or code differences. Uh, the reason for this two-network upgrade approach is to allow the new window post proof types to be accepted in the first upgrade, uh, while in the second upgrade, network version 20 uh, marks the spot where the older proof types will no longer be accepted. Uh, this allows for a smooth rollover period uh, during which both proof, proof types are accepted. Uh, Timeline-wise, uh, we expect to have the calibration network upgrade happening next week, uh, with the ghost upgrade happening on the 24th of April. Uh, on the calibration net. For mainnet, we expect uh, the network 19 upgrade to happen on the 10th of May, uh, with the network version 20 upgrade happening on the 17th of May. And yeah, that is most of the Falcon highlights. Uh, now I think it's on to the team updates. Awesome. Thank you.
Hello, fellow lab rats, uh, an update from the DRAN team. Uh, for those of you who don't know, DRAN is a threshold network for generating publicly verifiable, unbiasable random numbers. Uh, on the KPI front, our most important KPI is uptime. We've had 100% uptime, which is great because otherwise Filecoin goes down and everyone's day is ruined. Uh, on the roadmap front, uh, we've ticked off a bunch of items already and some more are pretty close to falling. Uh, we've released Unchained Randomness onto mainnet, which enables time lock encryption. We presented the time lock encryption at Real World Crypto two weeks ago. We released a paper on it and I even held a randomness summit there, but that's in a spotlight, so we'll come to that later. Uh, also, we focused a lot on community engagement in the last quarter. Uh, we onboarded three new LOE partners. Uh, we started bi-weekly office hours, which I invite any and all of you to come along to and uh, ask us lots of questions about DRAND. Uh, we also released seven blog posts, including a few cool tutorials on how to use DRAND, how to use DRAND on FVM, how to use time lock encryption, and much, much more. Uh, and as a result, community members have built lots of cool things on top of DRAND. Uh, so everyone seems to be a Rust station these days. We've now got multiple Rust clients. Uh, Thibaut from Cloudflare uh, developed a cool CLI for doing DRAND related stuff and time lock encryption, which the team are using and loving. Uh, also at an Ethereum hackathon, uh, a team called RNGesus provided DRAND integration for EVM. So hopefully we can see that in Ethereum mainnet soon. And also the StoreSwift team, who are also a member of the LOE, have uh, finished up a full Rust DRAN implementation, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, it, coming up uh, in the next quarter, it's all systems going FEM. Earlier than we expected, we sort of thought with the team being so busy, that would be a, a quarter further along. But here we are. Hopefully, it's uh, all systems go. Uh, also, we have an ongoing project with Social Income, a Swiss not-for-profit who provide universal basic income for people in Sierra Leone, and they want to use DRAND to select participants who will receive that so that warlords don't siphon off all the money to their families. Uh, also, hopefully, we get the FRC for time of encryption uh, commented on and accepted for FVM, and then we can start work there. Uh, thank you very much. Awesome stuff. Over to George for consensus lab. All right. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. So, uh, well, this is our update. It's uh, the font is a little small. I won't cover everything, but you can read it still. I mean, we, we don't have KPIs on the slide, but we do have our new draft OKRs, which cover both you know, the stewardship, the network growth, and uh, the compute uh, aspects, right? So we're, we're already making good progress on it. One of them is complete, the other is halfway there. But basically, we we have, you know, we intend to, to continue improving the, the Falcon protocol, making it more secure. We're doing some events. And uh, obviously, the, the, the big thing is really uh, IPC on mainnet. Uh, on that note, we, we did have a, a slight delay on our M1 uh, milestone, which is launching exactly one week from today, but we're also doing a more complete launch, so, so that's good. And the rest of the plan hasn't really changed, so we're still aiming for June for the mainnet deployment, uh, even though we'll just we'll complete our detailed plan uh, after after M1 closes next week. Uh, in terms of highlights, the, the, the more important part, yeah, so... IPC is actually live on, on SpaceNet uh, already uh, since, since March, uh, although without the, the cross-net messages. And for that reason, we've kept things fairly quiet. But again, launch is next week, so, so we're, we're now going to do a, a bigger push. Uh, well, I'm already going to the opportunities, but still, from, from, from that first launch, we have 26 subnets already deployed on, on SpaceNet. I mean, normally we tell people to, to use a local route, but, but we also have uh, instructions for using SpaceNet, and you know, people have been doing it. Obviously, these are all mostly you know, ephemeral tests. There's no actual applications, which is good because it's, we're going to reset it. But, but, but you know, people are actually uh, trying things out. Consistent broadcast was merged to Ozis Master. There's a, a spotlight on this, so I won't go into detail. And Consistent Day 23 uh, is taking place on the 5th of June. We received 35 paper submissions, so we exceeded our goal. And this time we also have invited talks from Zarco at Cosmos and, and Hagelos at, at Cardano. So, so we, we have a very good lineup for, for the event already. And we'll have a program on the 21st of April once the peer reviews are in. Uh, finally, opportunity is the big one. IPCM1 is launching April 20. We're finalizing the implementation this week, and we'll have a few more days of testing and, and bug fixing next week. We're doing a big uh, uh, announcement and, and public uh, uh, Sorry, and, and publicity uh, push. Uh, James, uh, thank you so much. Uh, James from, from the Lotus CSE team, thank you so much for, for your help on this. 
And Alfonso is going to talk about this a little bit more in the spotlights. And one final note, we do have a fresh proposal from Guy on making the, the EIP-1559, so the base fee mechanism more, more robust against malicious manipulation. That's a FIP discussion. Uh, it's 686. You can go there and opine. And thank you so much. Awesome. If we don't have Mike on the call, I'll just read it real fast. Probably a highlight here is that there is going to be a Crypto Econ Day in Austin in I believe something like end of April um, coming up soon. So definitely uh, come attend. Um, there's already a, a whole ton of folks who are planning to um, participate. Um, there's also three uh, economic FIPS planned to bolster the Falcon economy um, in uh, Q2. So uh, lots of plans there to, to keep uh, improving. Um, I know the crypto account team was very involved in the sector duration multiplier. There was some really great uh, analysis and back and forth between block science um, and crypto econ lab, um, a broader AMA. Um, if you're curious about that, um, please definitely do uh, watch the recording uh, or dive into any of the analyses. Um, and then finally, the Crypto Econ Lab is also working with a number of other groups across the PL network um, to help consult with them on design, evaluation, feedback on various different um, crypto economic proposals that might be building um, on top of Falcoin or building their own networks within the PL uh, network space. Um, and so lots of uh, new uh, prospective clients for Crypto Econ Lab, which is great. Over to Steph for Sentinel. Hi. So um, we have daily archival snapshots um, since Genesis. It's 100% complete. Um, it's one of Hector's last gifts before he went on sabbatical. Our timescale DB has uh, low latency monitoring, no gaps. And uh, we have actually reduced average da data latency to less than 30 seconds. Um, BigQuery historical chain data set is 11 weeks behind. Um, due to capacity issues, uh, we wanted to focus on supporting the FBM. Um, launch. For our roadmap, we were able to successfully support the network V18 launch and also onboarded PL, multiple PLN partners to our data sets in BigQuery, such as Starboard, Cryptio, um, Elementus, Labs, and so on. Um, and also um, Network Goods, for example, yesterday was able to successfully use the archival snapshots for their own work. Um, we are currently preparing for NV19 um, upgrade. Some highlights, we have analysis dashboards for hyperspace and mainnet, and the FBM team is going to take over for the, sec for the metrics going forward, and we will continue supporting them. Uh, Cryptio used uh, our data sets to complete the uh, storage provider's financial reporting progress from Genesis until end of year 2022. And that will be our next focus, is to deliver these data sets to um, other companies that need them as well, such as uh, Elementus for uh, Phil Plus. Uh, Crypto Econ Lab also used um, BigQuery to analyze ga uh, gas consumption pre post or pre FEVM launch and post FEVM launch. And we now also are extracting full history of FEVM actor balances and counts. Um, some opportunities, a lot more people are requesting for more recent BigQuery data. Um, and that's something that we would really like to focus on the next few weeks. And also, some uh, performance improvements in Lily to reduce uh, infra cost for us and the community. Awesome. Thank you, Steph. Um, on to our spotlights. Please. First, I start this one on here. Happy for anyone else to also jump in, but I just think we should all take a second, unmute, and just do a big round of applause for everyone who was involved in the FBM mainnet launch. Um, this technically happened after our last end result ham, so please unmute and let's all celebrate this awesome milestone. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Thank you all so much. Um, this is big and uh, super, super exciting to see all of the people who are now building on top of it. Um, lots of uh, shiny logos that are now participating um, and uh, lots of Falcoin that's getting deployed, lots of accounts that are getting created, um, lots of new applications that are now possible. So it's big. Um, thank you all for being a part of it. Over to Patrick for the randomness. Uh, yes, we ran the second edition of our Randomness Summit uh, in Tokyo, the first being online only in 2020. Our goal was to interact with people building in the same space as us and get to know some other people working on cool random things. Uh, we had 45 attendees from a variety of institutions, notably lots of different Ministry of Defenses, uh, but I confirm they weren't able to bribe us to uh, break the around, so it's fine. Uh, some of the cool follow-ups uh, that might be interesting are NIST are actually standardizing randomness beacons and threshold cryptography. Uh, so we're hoping to make DRAND, other than the reference implementation, uh, the first compliant implementation uh, with the NIST standard, which would be very cool. Uh, 
we're planning to host another randomness summit sometime in the future, this time potentially alongside another slightly more hackery event so we can encourage more people to actually build on top of DRANT. Uh, all the talks can be found uh, on YouTube. And if you're short on time, which uh, everyone seems to be, uh, Bernardo David from the University of Copenhagen gave a wonderful talk summarizing everything you can imagine about randomness, verifiable secret sharing, VRS, VDFs, quantum randomness, randomness from speed of light via satellites. Uh, it's all there. So check it out. There's a blog post coming soon. And also, I forgot uh, in the DRAND update to say the most important thing, we've got a new project lead, Eric, who's uh, I've seen us on the call. So Welcome, Eric. He's going to do lots of biz dev things. Uh, we've already taken DRAN to space, so hopefully Eric will be able to take DRAN uh, to the moon and beyond. Thank you very much. Eric, over to our uh, IPDX update. Hi. I'm excited to introduce IPDX's innovative solution to GitHub Actions Monitoring. As you know, GitHub currently lacks a comprehensive CI monitoring product, which prompted us to create our own. Our solution is quite elegant. We monitor web events, store the raw data in a PostgreSQL database, and use Grafana to generate insightful visualizations. Let's dive into a real-life example. Our main dashboard provides in-depth insights into GitHub Action workflows and jobs. By default, it displays organization-level information and groups results by repository. Users can easily select specific time series or even reconfigure the entire dashboard to focus on a specific repository. With the flexibility to choose time ranges, granularity, and grouping precision, our tool empowers users to gain unprecedented insights. Thanks to our monitoring solution, we can see that a week ago, LIDAR brilliantly optimized the Docker Publish workflow in Kuba, reducing its runtime by an impressive 90% by eliminating unnecessary QM virtualization. Our GitHub Actions Monitoring solution offers comprehensive insights and customization options. It gives our 2% Rim true superpowers. If you're interested in checking it out, let us know. Awesome. Nice update. Um, Tisdito. Hello. Hi. This is Matteo from CryptoNet. And what I'm going to bring on the spotlight in my less than a minute is the fact that Tisdito, our new SNAR scheme, went to open source. There's a report there and there is a blog post, which I invite you to check yeah. out. It's tiny in the bottom left over here, but I also share in chat. And our design is there and you can find lots of more details than what I'm going to tell you about. If you don't know what this to do is, in one sentence, is a very fast, uh, it's a snark with a very fast prover, very short proofs, and lots of nice features. But the main nice feature, like you mentioned, is it's universal and short. And what does it mean for Falcon? Uh, that means that you got easy and fast upgradability whenever you need it. You can do one single universal and easy setup. And it can give you fast proofs. While proving acceleration techniques are getting better and better, at some point, some design is going to matter. We're going to hit the wall with that. The studio will be ready to plug in when we need that. There's lots of other things I could I'd like to brag about, but I'd like to say, so what's happening next? This was the crowning of eight months of work. Uh, CryptoNet is not actively working on this, but we are looking for collaborators, external collaborators to improve on our implementations. And there's a paper coming up very soon. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, Alfonso, IPC. Thank you. So this is going to be really quick. I just want to call everyone to test the subnet. Like there's uh, in our repo in the APC agent, you already have some like getting started guide on how to run locally or on SpaceNet, your own subnet. It's true that there's no until the 20th. We won't release the, um, the CrossNet message support. So in the end, you will be able to run different subnets but not communicate between them. But it would be great if we can start getting some folks to test it and to like, please break it. <laughs> we want to see like what is wrong before we, we release it to the public. So there's there are some docs. There's a getting started guide in the IPC agent, uh, consensus shipyard slash IPC agent repo. But in any case, like probably we can share the links here and like drop us a message in, in the IPC dev 
uh, channel in Slack, and we can get you through the first steps. The UX is a bit rough, so any feedback is more than welcome. Right? We want to improve that. The first thing that we want to improve is UX. Like the tech is there, but the UX is a bit rough. Thank you. Over to Guy. Hi. Yeah. So it turns out Guy is sick, so so I'm gonna have to do it for for him. Current situation: uh, Falcon is actually vulnerable to a 20% attack, and you intuitively wouldn't expect it to be so because you only have one winning ticket out of five in expectation. But as it turns out. There are circumstances in which you can, if you can send different blocks. So with a single winning ticket, you can generate different blocks. If you send, if you send, if you generate and send a different block to each of uh, to each validator, then you can actually confuse people into preventing convergence uh, and and not building a chain while you keep building your private chain in parallel. So so that is the issue that we're addressing. The solution is consistent broadcast, which just which just means that you cannot send equivocated blocks, uh, broadcast uh, or send equivocated blocks to to the network, and so that raises the the attack bar to above forty percent, and it brings you to to the actual expected uh, situation uh, above. So uh, what does this cost us? And the good news is that it does not cost us uh, pretty much anything. The only thing that we need to do is to, to keep a cache of, of uh, the blocks we receive and a buffer and, and wait two to three extra seconds before actually considering a block valid to start building on it. Uh, that also means that no hard fork is required. This is actually an entirely client-based change that, that people can make. And that brings me to, well, next week to the actual announcement, which is the fact that this is already merged into Lotus Master and is on its way to production. There is a slight bug that, that we still need to, to figure out, but, but it's done. And so Falcon is safer. Thank you. Awesome. Over to Ian for ProBlab. Hi, it's Ian at ProBlab. Uh, I'm going to keep this quick because I want to uh, see uh, Hannah. Can you hear me OK? Um, ProBlab's mission is to measure the performance of Web3 protocols and evaluate them and propose improvements uh, in their design. Uh, and to that end, we run a lot of systems that collect data continuously. We monitor things like, uh, we call the IPFS network and, and the Filecoin uh, DHTs. We monitor website uh, performance. We analyze uh, DHT access patterns and the, and the performance. We have quite a lot of data. We kind of want to surface it in a better way, but we also want to surface it in a way that gives context to that data. So uh, what we have put together is some just started. It's really, literally only about two or three weeks old. It's ProBlab.io. Uh, it's a place for us to publish uh, the data we're working on and, and collecting, give some context around that in terms of like the methodology used to collect it, what it means, how to interpret it, what the limitations are in terms of how uh, that should be viewed. Uh, we're putting in data from other systems, uh, some of the stuff we've got in Grafana uh, and uh, Prometheus from other systems. Um, we want your data. Uh, if you've got data that you think uh, should be analyzed in, in alongside the stuff we're doing with uh, ProLab, then come talk to us. Um, and what we've got the idea is to bring this all together into kind of a hub. And around that wall, we're going to we're going to have uh, all the different things we've got. We're already doing things like weekly reports, and we've got the KPIs, and the stats.ibfs network, which is an overall overarching kind of place, you know, single point of in access for getting to see this data. Uh, so come along, have a look. I'm trying to keep it uh, uh, simple, but it's going to expand over time. It's under kind of a lot of work, uh, work in progress kind of stuff. So thanks, everyone. Great. And on to our deep dive with Hannah. So I would love to talk to you all uh, about this new tool that you may have seen uh, floating around our various networks called Lassie. Um, and essentially, in what Lassie is, is a retrieval tool. That is the bottom line. It is a thing to retrieve stuff uh, from our networks. Uh, it's a new IPFS client um, that can fetch content from pretty much anywhere. Um, it's written in Go. Um, in that respect, it's a new Go IPFS implementation like Kubo. Um, but we've sort of started from the ground up, and we have a single goal, which is downloading your data in IPFS and Filecoin. It should just work. Um, and we basically say, if you want your data, just tell Lassie to fetch it. That's our kind of our motto. Um, and essentially, the, the origin of Lassie is that as, as our networks have grown, we started to see a proliferation of some transfer protocols. While BitSwap is, is kind of our, our big, uh, our sort of bread and butter, um, we see a lot of graph sync on Filecoin. Um, we're starting to see a lot of folks interested in HTTP. Um, and this is all very interesting from a programmer perspective, but from a regular person perspective, no one really thinks 
what transfer protocol uh, would I like to use to get my data? That's not something that people care about. What they want is they want to get their data. Um, and uh, so Lassie is a multi-protocol retrieval pro client. So it, it can figure out what data is available on what protocols and figure out the best way to get it. Um, we already support BitSwap and GraphSync. Um, we're working on a trustless HTTP transfer protocol. And then in the future, maybe we will also add some cool stuff like this new thing that I wrote is working on. What is it called? Bow? Um, and, or if you've heard of Carpool or CarSync. Um, and we have another sort of like approach, uh, another sort of aspect of Lassie, which is in addition to not worrying about how you, uh, what protocol you use to transfer, you don't, we don't want you to worry about how you find your data. So Lassie uh, can find data through both the IPFS DHT. Um, we use IPNI, uh, the network indexer to talk to, talk to the IPFS DHT. Um, and we can find content on the Filecoin network. Um, we, you don't have to know where your data is. We'll just track it down. We can even track down some providers who don't put their content um, in the DHT through BitSwap. And as new content networks appear, we intend to add them to Lassie. So uh, goodness, though, if you haven't heard of the network indexer, I think that's the best way to advertise your content. It's super fast and super awesome. So how do you use Lassie? Um, so we've designed Lassie from the beginning with basically three main ways to use it. Um, the first is as a command line um, executable tool. Um, you can download Lassie already compiled and ready to go and just run it immediately to fetch data. Um, it's designed like, uh, we try to design it like a Unix command so you can pipe, pipe it and compose it with other things. And I'll, I'll show you how that works in a moment. Um, the second way you can use Lassie is we have built a uh, essentially a mini HTTP server um, that uh, exposes a trustless HTTP gateway um, that serves car files. Um, you, it, 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 it is much like the spec for the IPFS trustless gateway, but we do some other cool stuff. You can find things, you can, it, it can find data at a path beneath a, beneath a SID, and it can. It, there's a bunch of other things that go a little bit beyond what the current gateway spec is for trustless uh, data, um, though we are actually working on an IPIP proposal to extend it um, for, for trustless gateways for other IPFS implementations. Um, and finally, we've designed Lassie from the start uh, to work easily as a library, so you can easily incorporate it into your Go application uh, to seamlessly add a uh, retrieval from IPFS. IPFS and Filecoin into your into your Go program. Um, we see this as a sort of long-term Lassie superpower, um, and we'd love to partner with other organizations, other teams uh, who want to integrate Lassie into their systems. Cool. So there's a couple of things that Lassie will not do. We've we've built some design constraints into it, um, and we we put this in for the for a specific reason, which is that we want to stay focused on our goal, which is retrieving data. Um, as a result, Lassie does not store data permanently on your machine. We return a car file to you, and we think that's up to you to figure out what you want to do with it. Um, we also will not provide records to the DHT because, again, we're not holding data permanently. Um, you can't, uh, we do, we are not a way to advertise to the DHT, the IPFS DHT, or other content indexing systems. Um, essentially, uh, Lassie is not designed to be a full fledged IPFS server node. Um, we are largely stateless. Um, when you run us as an HTTP server, we hold on to a little bit of a temporary state just to make some optimizations, but um, our our, one of our goals from the start is there shouldn't be a config file or any other file that lives permanently on your system as a result of Lasty. Um, we are a state, essentially a stateless tool for the minute you stop uh, the stop the program running. Um, and we think that we we think this somewhat artificial design constraint is necessary as a way to keep our program simple, focused, and you know easy to use for other folks in their programs. Cool. So let's see what Lassie can do. Um, essentially, as I said, uh, Lassie uh, is a simple command line tool is one of the ways you can use it. Um, you can essentially tell it to fetch a given SID um, and then it uh, will return that to you. And it can return that to you as a data stream that you can part pipe to another program. In this demo, we actually uh, fetch a SID uh, and pipe that output directly to the go car command line tool. Um, and then we use the go car command line tool 
to um, uh, to convert it to the flat original data file. And then we pipe that into FFmpeg, the video player. And this is what you get. Again, we'll see if this actually works. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so here we are. We're typing it in. We're we're getting it for. We're putting in a provider. We're getting a SID. Then we're passing it to Car. We're passing it to an FF player, and you magically get a video playing on your screen. It's kind of cool that you can just go from straight from from a SID to a video playing. All right. Cool. I'm gonna stop that because it's super loud. So uh, another thing. So. So while Lassie's pretty new and it's definitely still in development, Lassie's not really a prototype project. We are already in production. We are the primary retrieval tool for uh, the Saturn network to do cache misses. So when the Saturn network gets a request for data and they don't have it, they just turn over to Lassie and say, find this data. Um, and through the Rayx project, which is the decentralized uh, gateway project, um, that translates to we're downloading about 140 million SIDs uh, a week through Lassie. So we, we've we got some, some heavy volume use case and we're working on optimizing. We've got a whole team working on it. Um, and uh, it's also, Lassie is also one of, increasingly one of the easiest ways to download data through Filecoin. So we're starting to recommend it to enterprise clients who want to put data on Filecoin and get back um uh we and we have as i said we have a team working on lassie we're continuing to optimize we're continuing to optimize how we select protocols we're continuing to optimize each protocol implementation and you know we're gonna our goal is to make it you know faster and better over time um so if you want to integrate lassie into your project i'd say go for it um we do have some work to do on documentation um but we're also working on that yeah, so uh, if you want to know, hear more about Lassie um, and you happen to be at an IPFS thing, you can come by the data transfer track um, where we're going to be doing a deep dive into the architecture. Um, you can also uh, just hit me up on Slack. Uh, it's probably the easiest way. I'm also happy to meet with folks one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you start to use Lassie, give us feedback, uh, file a GitHub issue. Uh, I didn't actually include the repo in here, but uh, talk to the Bedrock team. That's the team that's developing Lassie. Um, or, you know, know, complain to us on Twitter that we do not have a Twitter account. So you'll have to figure that one out yourself. Um, yeah, that's the pro that's the tool. That's what we got. Um, yay. Thanks. Oh, and uh, we're around for I'm here for questions. If we have any more minutes. No, it's 803. Never mind. Don't if you have any questions for Hannah, please fly to Belgium and ask her them in person uh, in her many Lassie talks at IQFS thing. Um, or stick them in chat or go stick them in the GitHub repo that maybe we'll yeah, was dropped in chat briefly. Really awesome and great to see the progress from tons of different groups. Hopefully we have a, a lot more to celebrate and share um, in this forum in a month from now, uh, post IPFS thing and um, the many awesome things that are getting uh, shipped and discussed uh, with the whole community there. So happy Thursday for most, Friday for some. Yay, Team Friday. Um, and happy April, everyone. Uh, excited to be in the throes of Q2. Uh, see many of you shortly.